Good evening, and thank you all for coming. Um, this is our the beginning of our week of One Book, One Island events, and um, unfortunately Stella has caused a few problems in our planning, but we're intrepid, are we not? <laughs> First, I wanted to thank the One Book, One Island committee for all their hard work. Um, we've been working on this for about nine months, um, so this snowstorm was a bit of a wrinkle for us. But I hope during the week that you'll have a chance to go down to the Artists Association Gallery. There's some wonderful art there that's been inspired by the book. You've never seen so many elephants gathered together in one room. It's really terrific. And we have five different sites for making origami elephants throughout the week, so make sure to use your own creativity, perhaps inspired by the book as well. And we'll bring together all of those origami boards um, for the finale on Sunday at the NHA. There are a couple of changes because of the storm. One of them is that the film tomorrow night that was to be at the Dreamland, 5.30, we're still going to show it, but we're incorporating it into the finale at the NHA on Sunday from 5 to 7. So it's a delightful film, so I hope we'll have a chance to see that as well. Also, we have an elephant specialist who was going to be coming up from New York City. Um, he was supposed to come tomorrow and be speaking on Wednesday. We have rescheduled him for next Wednesday. And originally, he was going to speak at the White Heron. But because of possibility of a storm next week as well, we're going to have him here at the Athenaeum, scheduled at the Athenaeum, and if in a storm happens, we will do something similar with Skype um, to bring him here because I want to make sure that you hear the wonderful things he has to say. So, also at the end of Vicki's presentation, there are a few books for sale. Um, we found that people have been bringing books back, but they immediately go out to people on the wait list. So, um, if you wanted to buy a book, there's some available at the end. All right. Now, let's talk about Vicki, uh, <laughs> um, who is coming to us from her home. And the way she's set up by in front of bookshelves like this, doesn't it look just like an alcove of the Athenaeum? I thought that was very clever, Vicki, very clever. Um, but it's actually your home in Newton, right outside of Boston. Um, and she's been exploring animal life for the last two decades, at least. Um, she's been tracking fossa in Madagascar, and I had to look up what fossa are, because I didn't see the animated film Madagascar, so I had no idea. And they're cat-like. And so maybe when we do a Q&A at the end of her presentation, if you want to know more about fossa, I'm sure she'd be happy to tell us. Also, she's done polar bears up in the Arctic Circle and Tasmanian devils in guess where? <laughs> yes, yes. She now covers animal issues for WBURFM, which is Boston's NPR news station. And she's earned a Edward R. Murrow Award and a Public Radio News Director's Award for that work. In addition to the Elephant Company, She's the author of The Lady and the Panda and The Modern Ark, The Story of Zoos. Vicki has also worked on nature documentaries for Disney and for the A&E Channel and anchored The Secret Life of Animals on NECN-TV. She also wrote the Boston Globe's Animal Beat column for 13 years and has contributed to The New York Times, The Washington Post, the London Sunday Telegraph, Time, Popular Science, O for Oprah, National Wildlife, and Discover Magazine, among others. Please join me in welcoming Vicki Clark. Thank you so much, everyone. I, I, I can't see you, but um, 
At the end, I'll be surprised by who's there. There we go. I heard one. <laughs> I, um, whenever I hear an introduction with my resume, I'm uh, reminded of my very first resume a long time ago, and I asked my mother to read it. And she said, uh, when she finished, I said, what did you think, Mom? And she said, her, I'd hire. You, I'm not so sure about. <laughs> well, I'm, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. It looks beautiful. And Molly and everyone at the Athenaeum, thank you so much for having me um, and for doing this tremendous event. I really appreciate it. I know this isn't the weather for monsoon Burma, but uh, let's try tonight to do a little time travel. We'll go back a hundred years to an exotic place on the other side of the world where villagers were said to still practice headhunting, to sacrifice humans to appease rice gods, to transform themselves into ghost cats who could snatch you right from row sleeping family members. This was the Burma that Kipling wrote about, a place like any land you know, he said the back of beyond the country, where the jungles were full of animals. Three kinds of rhino, bears, leopards, tigers, who sometimes stroll down City Street, and of course, elephants. So now we're gonna, that's good. Um, are you guys having an echo on your end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, I'm gonna take care of that right now. Okay. That's the magic crystal who you'll see at the end. It's like I'm receiving a message from the CIA. Does that work? <laughs> no one's answering. I can hear, but it's slow. That's better. We're really quiet. That's good. Can you hear us? Do you have an echo now, still? It's better. It's better. Okay, good. Great. Well, the red actually looks good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. Are you ready with your... Um, mm -hmm. right now? Yep. Oh, yeah. Terrific. Okay, we're going to go and shout out if, I, if you can't hear something or something goes wrong. Hey, Vicky? Yes? If, could I just request that maybe you slow down your talk just a hair? This is a little bit of a lag time. Great. That's, um, I'm happy to do it. Um, and if I start speeding up again, don't, don't hesitate to pop in and tell me to slow down again. <clears throat> in 1920, into that world came a tall, athletic, loping pound of a 23-year-old named Billy Williams, who had sailed from his home in England to the Teak Forest Burke. Is that slow enough? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. He traveled for the adventure, for some relief from the horrors he had witnessed as a soldier in World War I, and traveled around the world, most of all, the chance to meet elephants. He would get what he wished for, because by the time he left the country, 25 years later, he would know a thousand elephants by name. How Billy Williams changed from a carefree adventurer to a champion of elephants who fought for their humane care, and then into a World War II hero turning the tide for the Allied forces with his company of elephants, the only one on our side, would consume me for four years of research and writing. And it started with this little illustration in a book about elephants. It came to me in the mail one day when I was sitting down to have lunch at home. I was looking for my next big project after having written another book, The Lady and the Panda. 
That book was about Ruth Harkness, the dress designer and socialite. Against all odds, she became the explorer who brought the first live giant panda back to the United States in 1936. She would go on to fight against capture from pandas and for the conservation. That story was so deeply embedded in my soul that I wasn't sure I could fall in love with another. But here was this little picture. It shows an elephant high up on a cliff overlooking a jungle below. The caption said it was J.H. Williams escaping from Burma with his elephants in the 1940s. When I looked at this picture, I was hooked and was desperate to know more. It turns out this scene marks the pinnacle of Billy Williams' career. It was 1944 as the biggest battle for Burma was erupting. Williams had been threading his way through enemy territory over five mountain ranges and leading an enormous caravan of 53 elephants who were carrying a group of 64 sick refugee women and children. He was trying to bring them to the safety of India. It was the worst, most aggressive fighting of the war. And with the sounds of Japanese mortar and gunfire all around him, he had come to a dead end, a sheer cliff face that rose about 270 feet. He couldn't go back, as every soldier at the time said. The enemy would have killed them and done worse, especially to women before they were dead. He couldn't go around this mountain. It went on for miles in either direction. He had to go over it. And how he did that would become legend and could never have been accomplished without the lifetime of love and work in Burma with the elephants that came before it. Many international publications had written of Billy Williams's exploits and heroism in the war, but to me, the richest part of the story would be his transformation. How did plain old Billy Williams become the elephant whisperer and war hero, Elephant Bill? He had been hired right after World War I by the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation, a Scottish firm, whose ranks had been thinned by war. Billy was one of 41 forest assistants firm brought over to Burma, the country then under British rule. Most of the novices would not last. Within seven years, 25 would be gone, dead, dismissed, and they would continue to vanish. It was estimated that only 4% would finish their service. Billy Williams was among that hardy group of survivors. In fact, he thrived, despite the heat, the leeches, malaria, smallpox, dysentery, and countless other tropical diseases, and constant dangers of forest travel, and even the occasional killer elephant. Williams would be among the men who were called nomads of the forest. They constantly traveled a circuit in their own territory, overseeing several logging camps, where they would be in charge of about 300 men and 100 elephants. For most of the men, the elephants were just part of the equipment, but for Williams, they were revelation. He had always loved animals in a profound way. He wrote, quote, I have never studied them as a naturalist, but I have tried to establish an understanding with them, to find some common ground, some way of seeing the world through their eyes rather than through my own. And when he saw the world through the eyes of elephants, it was life-changing. Williams traveled with a caravan of pack elephants called Travel. And then he would visit camps with the big working elephants, including the biggest bulls. All these elephants were kind of half captive and half wild, working about six hours a day and being released into the forest for the rest of the time to live and eat, much like free wild elephants. Williams would work with them all day and then, often enough, follow them at night reporting his observations in words and pictures. Williams' study of the animals became an addiction. Everything of interest became elephants, 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 he wrote. He was not a veterinarian, but out of necessity became a skilled elephant doctor, most often treating deep skin infections the elephants got gear rubbed against them, more rarely patching them up after tiger bombings. Living day by day with elephants, Billy Williams discovered in them the virtues he would develop in himself. Courage, 
loyalty, the ability to trust, fairness, patience, diligence, kindness, and humor. Some of the most pivotal, pivotal moments of William's life were guided by elephant character and culture. He won over a monstrous box by refusing to back down, just as he, as he had seen serious bull elephants do with each other. His courtship of Susan, the woman who would become his wife, mimicked that of graceful tuskers who gently followed a female, reading her mood and approaching when invited. And I love this picture of, uh, I think Susan would get a kick out of um, having their courtship described as these um, male been dogging a female. And when Williams came to command men in war, he fully understood the difference between a leader and a bully. The elephants had taught this distinction too when they organized themselves behind a confident female at dangerous river crossing. How he learned all that was simple. He lived with them every day and he watched them. And the lessons came fast. Right away on his first trip into the forest, he came to understand the deep bonds elephants form when he saw one female break away from the others run back to camp, back to her twice sin or bonded sister outfit who'd been calling to her. Sorry about the phone, not in Burma. He vowed to make it his policy to never disrupt these kinds of bonds. And we know now from modern scientists that he was right. Alternate relationships last a lifetime and appear to be as close and strong as any we humans hold dear. Elephants risk their own lives for each other. They help sick friends stand or eat. They help raise each other's babies. They forgive. One researcher saw two sister elephants walking peaceably side by side. The tusk of one had broken off and was embedded in her sister's side. Clearly, they had had a fight and made up. I have a wonderful sister, and I know that if we had tusks, I can imagine the same thing happening to us. <laughs> we can also identify with the fact that elephants have an awareness of death, and they can die of heartbreak. One of the first observations Williams made of their intelligence was the way in which elephants can hide themselves from their Uzis or handlers. After work, the elephants released into the forest during loops, teak bells, and each morning, the elephants are never very far away. The men set out to find them by sound. Each bell, handmade by the elephant's own rider, carries a distinct tone. But on the occasions in which the elephants have got to some really good and don't want to be found, they stuff mud up into the bells to silence them. Williams thought this kind of deception was a sign of real intelligence, and he was right. His elephants amazed him at every turn. He knew a thousand elephants, and each of them taught him something. There was Ma Shui, a classic matriarch. William saw her rescue one of her calves from a raging river in what was basically a deep canyon. Using her trunk, the mother elephant had to lift her baby up to place her on a rock ledge. And even though she herself was then swept away by the torrent, she survived to come trumpeting back to her frightened, shivering baby. There was Ma Cha, a sweet elephant, who was also a little bit of a ham. She had been attacked by, and William spent weeks treating her infected wounds. Later, after she seemed completely healed and he returned to visit her, she did something odd. Running up to Williams and sitting right on her duck with her back to him, something he had never seen any elephant do. Later that day, when he discovered a hidden infection in Macha's back, he wondered if she had been asking him as her doctor for help. There was little guide man, the five-year-old elephant who knew that his blind mother depended on him as he patiently led her around for the rest of his life. And most of all, most of all, there was Bandula, big, beautiful, and brilliant. He was one of the largest tuskers in the Bombay Burma stable. Gentle enough, softly take a treat from William's hand, tough enough to have killed a wild tusker in the forest. 
How can an elephant be beautiful? He had pink freckling across his cheek and trunk, and the kind of tusks edged up and outward that the thing said were like arms of a Burmese dancing girl. His physique was perfect for the heaviest log work. This was an elephant so legendary among the ranks of the loggers that William said nearly every one of them, every forest man at the time, would claim to have worked with him. But he meant much more to Williams. Billy Williams would save Randula's life by tending to him for a year after a fight with another tusker. And Bandula would say Williams by carrying him across a raging monsoon swollen river to get him medical care when he was near death. Bandula would be the model for Williams' notions of gentling rather than breaking elephants for logging work. Bandula had been raised by a master mahu named Potok, and Potok's methods were the antidote to the barbaric and traditional capture and training methods that were standard practice. Bandula, raised by love kindness, <laughs> was a smarter and more reliable working elephant, and he had picked up much of his training almost by osmosis. He knew mit, sit, and ta, stand, and would rise up or lower himself, mirroring his mother's movements as she was given these commands. It was an act that was a little comical to the men, so no surprise that even as he matured, Van Dukla seemed to have a sense of humor. The elephants worked hard pushing and pulling huge teak lots to creeks and rivers so the lumber could float and steer to the mills in the city. Occasionally, after Van Dukla had hefted a large log to the very edge of a river, he would pretend he couldn't move it anymore. He would pantomime the effort of a sub again and again and behave as if the wood were suddenly unmovable. Only after his Uzi would beg him to stop clowning would he suddenly flick the log over the precipice with no effort at all. Then as everyone swore, the elephant would rumble at his own jump. We can hear it. Before Williams met Bandula, he was skeptical of what the men told him about the elephant. But the minute he touched the tusk, he felt a mystical connection to him. It was not merely that chance or fortune brought me together with him, he would write years later, his destiny. Rubbing the high portion of the tusker's trunk, he sensed an unbreakable bond being formed. In that instant, Williams had a feeling of understanding as a fellow creature, closer than many human beings, he said. Williams would prove to the company that better care of elephants made economic sense. The only way to get them to approve his plans for an elephant school and elephant hospital, institutions that continue to exist today, now in the watch of the Myanmar government. Billy Williams always said he learned to be a better man under the guidance of his elephants. The people around him agreed. His wife Susan, he met in the jungle and courted in Rangoon in a series of incredibly romantic dates, said the characteristics that made him good with animals made him good with people too. It was a blend of reverence and intimacy. He was beloved by his so-called servants, who were most often misfits no one else wanted, but in whom he would see great love. When war broke out in Burma, Williams understood the best contribution he could make would be with his elephants and assigned to the Elite Force 136, the British Dirty Tricks Department. He formed a small band of irregulars, along with a large herd of elephants, and he operated behind enemy lines. His elephants carried supplies, but made their biggest contribution by building bridges, making troop movement possible in the roughest terrain. Williams started Elephant Company with just one elephant. Of course, it was Bandula. But his old elephant riders risked their lives, sneaking elephants through dark forests so they could join ranks of Williams' elephant company. And Lieutenant Colonel Williams snatched elephants right under the noses of the Japanese. One elephant here, 20 there, until at the peak, 1,652 war elephants. 
By war's end, they had built 270 bridges, and historians credit those log elephant bridges with helping to save the war, especially because they could bank their daily bridge materials. That's lightweight portable bridge sections for when and where they really needed it, like an important crossing of the Chinwin River. And that brings us back to that little illustration of the elephant, high up on a cliff overlooking the jungle. By this time in Billy Williams' life, he knew how smart elephants were. He had formed incredible friendships with many of them, and he had developed an uncanny ability to communicate with them. But even he was not sure he could or should persuade them to climb what was basically a ladder or stairway that he and his men, in desperation, had chiseled into the face of a cliff. He never once considered abandoning the elephants at the bottom of that cliff, by the way. He didn't want the enemy to get them, because he had seen some horrific wounds and injuries to the elephants under Japanese care. So this is how Billy Williams came to act 53 elephants, single file, including Bandula in the lead position, to climb straight up cliff. Knowing how Williams got them to do it is more understandable when you know the backstory, but it's no less magical. In fact, maybe even more so. For me, it's proof of what can happen when any person opens his or her heart to animals. It also brings me back around to the first days of beginning my own journey of telling the life story of Elephant Bill. Along with archival research in London and here in the States, and having access to William's private papers, now with his son in Tasmania, I knew the key to understanding Bill Williams was going to be in understanding the elephants themselves. I couldn't meet Bandula or Mashwe or Clyde Man, but along with videographer Kristen Godin, I could get to know two elephants here in Massachusetts at the Buttonwood Park Zoo in New Bedford. Emily and Ruth were my best resource for this book and the greatest gift. They taught me a lot about elephants and even more about life. So I'd like to show you a short film Kristen and I made from WBUR, where we cover animal issues for the show here now. And I'm happy to tell you that this is the seven minute video that won that Edward R. Morrow Award. So here are my girls, Emily and Ruthie. biggest part of an elephant is? I think it's their personalities. Two years ago, head keeper Bill Sampson introduced videographer Kristen Gogan and me to the two Asian elephants at the Buttonwood Park Zoo in New Bedford. From the first moment, being in their company opened a whole new world. It was heaven. We loved Emily and Ruth, even before we could tell them apart. <laughs> Very quickly, though, distinguishing the girls became easy. Here, 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 right, yeah. Emily's a pretty elephant, a big girl with a massive skull and a well-muscled trunk that seems as thick as a tree. Ruthie, on the other hand, well, Ruthie's super goofy. She's got more character than classic good looks. <laughs> She's pigeon-toed. Lurches from side to side when she walks. Here we go. Her trunk, about the most important appendage to an elephant, is partially paralyzed. It was like that when she was rescued in 1986, get this, from a garbage dump in Danvers where her previous owner had discarded her. But Ruth's a survivor. She can more than compensate for her problem by swinging her trunk like a pendulum, gaining enough momentum to land it where she wants. We were coming to the zoo every other week, me for a book I'm working on, Kristen for a video project, and we began to see right away the amazing differences in the elephant's personalities. Ruthie's a comedian. If there were a lampshade big enough, Ruthie would wear it. She's also pure sweetness. Everybody loves Ruthie, and Ruthie loves everybody, but not Ruthie. From day one, she liked me, but she loved Kristen. 
nearly running over to her when we walked towards the exhibit area. On every visit, she would trunk hug her, even when Kristen was trying to work. Her keepers were amazed the day Ruth happily abandoned her supper to come greet Kristen. Ruthie's like a devoted dog around Kay Santos, following her and even bringing her sticks. That all started when Kay, just kidding around, taught her to fetch. We get the impression that Ruthie could care less about those sticks, but she's crazy about Kay. Most of all, Ruthie lives for Bill Sampson, the man who day after day patiently rehabilitated her 26 years ago when no one else would go near her. That's when Ruthie was labeled a striker or dangerous animal. Bill's greatest achievement is that now she's a lap elephant, always wanting to cuddle. Emily is much more reserved, though she'll almost always come say hello and even listen in on conversations like a nosy backyard neighbor. We came to appreciate Emily's quirks. We love it when she casually crosses her back legs when standing on her and when she politely knocks on the barn door to be happy. But the most interesting thing about her is that she loves to drive. And those who studied her say she's actually got rhythm. Emily's a little mysterious. No one really knows why she does this. But the thinking is that it has something to do with the fact that elephants use infrasound, or sound too low for human hearing, sound we often experience as a vibration in our chests. Emily and Ruth are really connected, but they can get on each other's nerves. Then Emily needs alone time. But both girls share an elephantine desire to form bonds with those around them. Yes, that's an elephant fart you heard. We loved watching them play games with their keepers. We loved seeing their evening Tai Chi. For me, as for most people, the issue of how we keep animals in captivity is complicated. But there's nothing complicated about the pure joy of seeing the strong relationship between these elephants and the people who care for them. When keeper Jenny Thuman left the zoo to move to Chicago, I was there for her last day. Her goodbye was wrenching. Then there was something amazing that happened on the day we filmed mass art students at the zoo. They had come to present toys they'd made to the elephants. It was a big day for the girls. There was a lot going on, new things to play with, and snacks to be eaten. In the midst of that, we were lucky enough to see something extraordinary. Separately, both Ruth and Emily cut away from the action just to be close to Bill Sampson. He had forgotten he was wearing a microphone, and particularly when he was with Ruth, it gave us a chance to eavesdrop on something beautiful, a very intimate conversation between an elephant and her closest human companion, a glimpse of a bond many of us only dream of having. Hey, Ruthie. You're not supposed to be coming to see me. You know that, don't you? Huh? You know that, don't you? Good girl. Good girl, Ruthie. Good girl. Good girl, and a girl, Ruthie. Good girl. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're a good girl. Yeah. Oh. Good girl, play with it. Go ahead. Play with that.
I felt a little bit like being in a deprivation tank. <laughs> hey, I'm going to be quite here on screen, but... <laughs> and we're going to be coming here to the Buttonwood Park Zoo on a regular basis. And as we get to know these elephants, you will too. Like videographer, video artist. I would love it if people have um, questions. It's my favorite part of a talk. If somebody wants to ask a question, I'm happy to repeat it here for so that they can hear it. Anybody have a question? Well, I'd like to hear more about the, her first introduction and who sent her that um, picture of the elephant. Okay. So maybe the question is, who sent you the, the picture of the elephant? that inspired you to write the story? It, was, it came in a book. There's a little series of uh, books that actually Kristen can... Oh, you know, I think I may have it in the elephant part. There's a series of books that come to me. It's called Reaction Press. I think it's from University of Chicago. They're very small. It's a series of species, and um, it's not my favorite series. It often... Here we go. Um, and it, it's often just about art and culture of the animals, and I always like the, um, the biology, but this goes to show many times I feel in my life uh, the best things have come to me when I've resisted them, um, so that series is not my favorite, but I sat down to look through it, and there was the photograph that changed everything for me. The book before this one, The Lady and the Panda, uh, came because I, much earlier I, I had written um, a series book about zoos and the issues of keeping animals in captivity. And my editor, uh, then at Scribner, said uh, he was uh, interested in knowing something about the history of zoos. And I thought that just have a place in my book, uh, and I argued with it, but, I, but then I did it anyway. And that's where I came across two sentences that led me to the story of Ruth Harkness, the socialite, brought the first giant panda back in 1936. So uh, that's that series of books, and that's where the photographing of the um, illustration, and by the way, um, we have no photographs known of Bandula, um, nor any really great photos of uh, Elephant Hill, uh, obviously with Bandula, uh, but he was a terrific uh, artist himself, and we he saw uh, watercolor there, and I think that the illustration, the illustration of the book is not Elephant Bill's own drawing was based on a drawing that he did. I did hear it, uh, and if everyone else did too, it was about how to keep elephants from being bored in the zoo. And this is a huge problem, and this is why uh, there is a basic paradox, as I said in my, my zoo book. Zoos are tremendous things to animals, and some of my favorite animal heroes work in zoos. But the paradox is that wild animals don't belong in cages. And um, if any of you have a dog, I know that uh, years ago at night, uh, I would hide a milk bone somewhere in the house for the dog, but I ran out of places to hide it pretty quickly and uh, that she didn't know already. And to think about a zoo in a small space, so this comes under the heading of enrichment. And there are experts in the zoo world, uh, biologists, scientists, really study uh, the ways that you can enrich the life of a captive animal uh, and um, make that if they can't increase the space of the exhibit, uh, even if they can increase the space, you want to increase the psychological space. And so that can be done sometimes with either recording or sense or puzzle feeders uh, where they have to look at something. Um, but this is, you know, you're getting right at a big issue. If those animals are in captivity, how can they possibly, how can they get to any natural behaviors? You want natural behaviors, you want them to have uh, the kinds of behaviors they would in the wild, and you would want them to have uh, spend about the same amount of time on those behaviors as they would in the wild. And it's, it's 
not always, this is why there's a there's controversy for people on both sides of the issue. And we see elephants being slaughtered every day in the news about elephants with their tusks and their numbers having gone down dramatically. Uh, well, I wrestle with these issues myself, and I do think uh, Emily and Ruth are safe. I do think that, but, um, but it's a very complicated issue. Sanctuary that's still running uh, called Tula Tula, and his wife in South Africa, and his wife is still running it. Um, I know the basics of that story. I I do wonder. Um, I don't know uh, how that's possible uh, that they did that. There are we know that elephants uh, oh, more than here. I'm just say they they can't stand death. Recognize yeah. phone. Could you just speak a tad slower? Yes, sorry. Um, they elephants have an appreciation of death. Uh, it's been um, recorded over and over uh, that when they come upon the bones of other animals, they notice of other elephants. They spend time with the bones, and if it's a relative. It appears that they have a they have some recognition, uh, and another thing that is um, fascinating to me is uh, that elephant researchers, in wanting to study an elephant's uh, understanding of death, their standing uh, of sound, far away they can understand sound if they recognize voices. In Africa, researchers have played the recording of a dead elephant relative. And the elephants were so set and agitated uh, that those researchers said they would never do it again. Because uh, clearly, the elephants did recognize the voice of relatives they hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, so there is. In a way that we're just starting to understand uh, how deep that goes. And they have, um, they even sometimes cover their foot over the bones of others. And we don't entirely know what kinds of information they pick up that way, but we know that elephants uh, use insects, which is a frequency too low for human hearing, uh, and it can travel great distances. And one of the things that happened once, uh, uh, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, um, she participated in the study, but Katie Payne, who had studied whales, uh, is the scientist who uh, confirmed and discovered that elephants use it for sound at low frequency, and that can travel great distances and provide information to each other. And that solved many researchers. In Africa, they'd be up in, a, in an airplane they could see for miles down below, uh, and so many of them reported this strange phenomenon in which they would see elephants far away from one another suddenly turn as though they had made a phone call to one another and a plan to meet. And they turn and head directly for one another and do just that. And among them, the joke was elephant ESP. But soon, uh, Kate Payne uh, and her colleagues are the one once found out it was an elephant EFP, so, so some of that might be in there, uh, but that it was that instance Too low for hearing, traveled long distances, and they could make plans. Do they still use elephants for logging in Burma? I'm happy to hear that. that 
question. Uh, I've done, uh, Christian and I did a story on this. Yes, they do. And for many of us uh, who love wild animals, the notion of them working isn't a, a happy one. However, uh, logging has done, logging in Burma, Myanmar, uh, has done a couple of amazing things. One, it saved the lives of uh, the population of, the el of elephants in Myanmar by making them uh, worth something. Uh, and we know in India, where they're largely uh, elephants are out of work, uh, they, elephants and their mahout, go begging in the street for food and for money. But in Myanmar, they still had a job to do. They're still employed. Uh, the other thing about elephants doing the logging work is that they pull logs out one at a time, so they're not clear cutting the forest. And the logging industry is not clear cutting the forest of Myanmar. Uh, it's a better practice for the environment. More forest means elephants. So Myanmar, though it's a fraction of the size of India, uh, has the um, second largest population of wild Asian elephants in the world, and it has the uh, largest population of uh, captive elephants. But I would call them half, half captive, half wild. Uh, if my Irish wolfhound is coming into the... <laughs> I have a question about the book. I'd like to know a little more about the man who trained Bandula. You indicated, obviously he, was a, he brought a wonderful new strategy to training them, but you indicated at some point that he had other motives. Maybe he was a rebel, and it wasn't clear to me, uh, so I'd like a little more information about him. Uh, po Pocho, thanks for that question. Uh, the way that the elephant bill learned to gentle elephants uh, was through a, a visionary uh, Mahout or Uzi elephant handler in Burma. And so he had named Bandula. I always feel that uh, an unfair, there is a unfair in that Hoto is the originator of that idea, but it was under, Burma was under colonial rule. And so his ideas were expe expressed, obviously, through a Westerner. And the great thing to me about uh, Wilson Phil um, is that he recognized, recognized that the gentling process. At the time, at uh, the 1920s, uh, when Elephant and Bill came to firm, the company, the company was losing 70% of the calves that were born. And that's because they just put the mothers to work right away uh, after they had their babies. Uh, so the, the calves died. They didn't get enough attention. They didn't get enough food. Uh, they weren't protected. They could be. And so um, what what Billy Williams realized is that uh, the way he could sell it by the, the economic reason. And so if you trained elephants from uh, an early age, they were more reliable. Uh, they learned uh, their tasks better. They, as it turns out, they, they lived longer. But all of that Poto, the one, um, I would say, blind spot, maybe, uh, for uh, J. Williams. He was completely patriotic to his own country, uh, to England, but he had trouble, uh, I think, fully appreciating the desire of uh, the, the citizens of, of Burma to want their own country um, to themselves. So mo he was Certainly not alone, and he was much, uh, Billy Williams was um, much more 
a much more understanding of that uh, than his colleagues. But still, so I don't know Koto's point of view because he didn't write his story. Uh, it was, wasn't was written uh, in English. I tried to uh, understand to me, he may have been part of a rebel school. Um, he very likely wanted to be independent for his country. And um, there was definitely a disagreement between Pochok and people that he worked for over that. A lot of that is kind of um, hidden from our view. We do know Pochok lived on after the war, and um, uh, Jim or Billy Williams, I always go back and forth because his family called him Jim, and his colleagues called him Bill. Uh, there was a letter from an American dentist, I believe, who visited uh, uh, Burma later wrote, wrote to Billy Williams that he found uh, people who knew Potok and that he was alive and, and well. Uh, but I, I think Potok uh, is a very interesting character um, and came up with this tremendous um, idea that no one else was doing. responsible for Bandula's death. Mm. And I didn't understand that at all. I um, to his dying day, uh, J.H. Williams um, felt that Pocho, and I say I set out his reasoning of what he thought, that he felt um, that Bandula couldn't stay with him at war's end and he'd rather kill Bandula than see him with someone else. Uh, they never proved that Poto did it. I, I'm not at all convinced that um, that Poto killed Bandula. He definitely, before, had taken a lot away from Poto. He certainly, the concept of having a client is something that the country, um, that the uh, company introduced, but he would never get it after the war. Uh, he felt, Poto, I believe, felt that he was not getting uh, rightly what he was due. And I think it was hard on him, but I, to me, there was never the proof that Toto actually killed Bandula. They are, and. Um, I just got an invitation. We haven't been there to see them. It's interesting because uh, they're trying, at the time of doing stories, they were hoping to expand uh, their uh, night quarters, they call them, uh, and their uh, exhibit area. Uh, over time, some of that um, was, ne was not true. Most of the people we did in that story just a few years ago, many of them bought um, from the zoo, uh, but the but the girls uh, are still there. I'm a Ruthie is my age. I'm 58. I think Ruthie and I are the same age. Emily both, uh, which is uh, for sensitivity, they have problems if you don't in a while. Uh, is is it old? Is old. I'm, I was hoping someone in the audience would have a new book for me. <laughs> I'm a little bit drawn to, I, I'm looking for a complex story like this one that absorbs me, and I hope you. Uh, I'm in love with rhinos lately and wolves. Uh, and uh, so I don't know where it's going to. In the meantime, Chris and I are doing. Um, animal reporting for National Public Radio, and so that brings us a lot of animal stories. And, um, uh, but that last question I think was planted by my publisher, my agent, who would like me to hurry up and... <laughs> 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 okay. well, thank you for joining us, Vicki. Thank you, everyone. I wish if I were there, I could...